Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the world's best investing podcast. Today, I'm going to be sharing my takeaway from ASTS's Q1 2025 earnings report. ASTS is the ticker for a company called AST Space Mobile, which is building D2D satellites that can beam broad- broadband directly to smartphones without modifying the underlying hardware. And it's very interesting because no one else can really do this. And so for now, ASTS is positioned to take the whole D2D market and essentially become a free cash flow machine overnight, potentially printing billions of dollars of free cash flow just like that, because they are closing deals with MNOs, mobile network operators. And so once they deploy a critical mass of satellites, which is between 45 and 60, according to management, they're going to have potentially billions of customers signing up just by clicking yes on an SMS. So the market is pricing this in relatively because you have a a very avid uh, retail investor community and the stock is relatively pricey given the financials at present. But what's happening now, very interesting in Q1 2025, is that for the first time ever, management reported gateway bookings. Gateway bookings are basically the money that MNOs, mobile network operators, are spending to acquire equipment that's essential to integrating AST space mobile satellite network with terrestrial cellular uh, infrastructure, meaning that it's the stuff that mobile network operators need to do useful things with ASTS as satellites. Now, gateway bookings came in at $13.6 million in Q1 2025, and ASTS management hasn't ever reported gateway bookings before this quarter, allegedly, I assume, because there were none. Now, what this means is that MNOs are happy staking money on actual equipment that is necessary to do something useful with AST satellites. And what that means is that likely the upturn remarks in the Q1 2025 call are likely an accurate reflection of what's happening. Abel Avellan, the CEO of this company, started the call saying that ASTS is going through an inflection point and that the pace of satellite manufacturing is going up. Uh, And they expect to be deploying this uh, over 60 satellites during 2025 and 2026. And, you know, while when you analyze a company like this, it's such a young company, essentially a venture capital kind of play, you have to be able to assign odds to the remarks coming from management being true or not. Meaning management can say whatever they want, but it's up to you as an investor to figure out whether it's actually an accurate depiction of what's going on. My take is that Per the onset of gateway bookings, it must be that ASTS is nearing uh, takeoff, so to speak, because otherwise MNOs wouldn't be spending money on this equipment. Now, the thing with MNO, sorry, with uh, gateway bookings is they are going to be a leading indicator of ASTS's progress over the next 12 to 18 months as they increase the production of satellites, because as they do, and as they get better at manufacturing, we're going to see MNO spending more or more consistently on gateway equipment, such that if we see that metric stay the same or go up over time, that will likely indicate that ASTS is making good progress, and that therefore, this thesis whereby ASTS becomes a free cash flow machine that prints billions of free cash flow practically overnight per the frictionless distribution that they have ahead via the deals with MNOs is likely doing well. Now, the thing is that this metric won't continue scaling beyond the next 12 to 18 months, most likely, because ultimately ASTS's satellites are the largest uh, commercial satellites ever. And every generation that they launch is actually much bigger than the previous one. So we have the next generation satellites, which are coming up now, are 3.5 times bigger than Block 1, which is their first generation satellite. So essentially, they, they just need... 45 to 60 satellites to cover the whole of US, Europe, and Japan. We're talking about full coverage of these geographies 24 7, regardless of your position, etc., because they just need just under 60 satellites or, or, or 60 satellites. You don't need to be doing all these gateway operations all the time. Once you put these satellites up in space, um, you're done, basically. So this metric won't continue scaling, but I think it's a very important metric to continue monitoring over the coming year, year and a half, because this can turn into a very, very successful investment. As I was saying, the market is not unaware of the potential. What the market is doing here is basically pricing in. ASTS has extraordinary organizational capabilities or process power, as I like to summarize it. 
and sort of using that qualitative observation to assign a probability to ASTS ultimately deploying the 45 to 60 satellites correctly and then managing to operate them uh, in order to deliver signal to these geographies on Earth. Right now, simultaneously, what happens is that as they accelerate towards in this race of manufacturing and deploying 45 to 60 satellites, CapEx is going up, cash flow production is going down, and actually quite rapidly so. So financially, this company remains a very risky pick. It's different to HIMS and, say, Palantir a few years ago and stuff in that you could say these two companies were also venture capital kind of place, but they did have at least clear visibility into positive free cash flow production. So that is the main uh, risk component of the thesis, excuse me. Uh, but however, they did manage to increase their cash, posi cash position this quarter by raising um, something like, uh, I have it written down here, something like $400 million uh, in convertibles. So they actually have more cash than debt, but both are rising quickly. And so what you have now is this typical scenario, actually not so typical, but you see it fairly frequently in technology, at least in the realms of excellent execution, in which you have the core technology progressing adequately, the exponential kind of potential uh, still working out. I think ASTS has this exponential future ahead, potentially, if they execute well. But at the same time, you have worsening financials, a worsening balance sheet, uh, if you normalize for the extra debt that the company is acquiring. And so you have a scenario in which I'm not immediately... Um, I'm not, I'm not compelled to jump in, but I am compelled to continue tracking this because ultimately, if you were in Spain a few weeks ago, you would have witnessed this shutdown that we had, both electricity and signal. And I was thinking about ASTS the whole time. And, you know, having signal in a communist or pseudo-communist country, as is Spain, uh, is a great thing. So I would have paid for ASTS, certainly. I would have paid for Starlink. I would have paid for Tesla's batteries, everything. And I'm going to be acquiring these things by the way, over the coming year and stuff, because I believe it will happen again, because that's just the nature of these things. But um, generally, I think that Signal worldwide, wherever you are, etc., is a great value proposal. Uh, and then I do think that longer term, this scales as the space economy takes off. If, if you would have asked me about the space economy before studying Rocket Lab deeply over the past two years, I would have said, well, this is just some sort of retail investor, which I am myself, kind of hypey thing, which is possibly overhyped. But I think that these space companies are developing very fast. And what's happening now, and ASTS is a major player here, is we are having space platforms being built, both in terms of getting stuff up there and then operating stuff from space. And so I think that ASTS has a future in not just beaming broadband to Earth, but to space, where we will have many machines, many robots, etc. And D2D, I think, is going to be a huge, huge market. I continue to believe that ASTS's execution is world-class. So I think I have a relatively well-trained eye to spot excellent world-class founder operators and whether they are able to infuse their organization's DNA with their own DNA. And I think Abel Avellan has certainly done this here. And so you have the combination of exponential potential that could happen overnight per the frictionless distribution method, an extraordinary founder leading the company, the rest of the company exhibiting signs of extraordinary culture, which I would basically summarize as they are pushing the frontiers of humanity's capabilities in space, both technically and in terms of the missions they are able to operate, etc. You can go and check out my original deep dive for that. But basically, these guys being much smaller than SpaceX and not being vertically integrated in terms of having their launch capabilities built in, I think these guys are pushing the limits to an extent that necessarily reflects uh, extraordinary culture. Now, one thing that caught my eye in Q1 2025 is that actually over half of the CapEx comes down to launch. And so one thing that happened is that, uh, let me just look up the data for you. Yeah, so they, they now expect the satellites to cost uh, between 21 and $23 million instead of 19 to 21 million dollars that they were guiding for previously and so what's happening here is that the launch chain so all these providers that uh, shoot up the rockets so you can send stuff to space are working more slowly because i don't know maybe there's too much demand or something they didn't specify that but essentially asts is paying premiums in order to keep up the previous speed 
And because half of the cost, sorry, half of the CapEx for ASTS is uh, launch, and then it seems that the launch chain isn't as efficient or isn't as efficiently, isn't as capable of absorbing launch demand as it seemed like a year ago. I think that although ASTS's specialization is likely to prevail because I think their technology stack is complicated enough for even players with a vertically integrated launch capacity to not be able to emulate it, although I expect that to happen, I do sort of, I do appreciate now that most of ASTS's financial strain comes from them not being vertically integrated in terms of launch capabilities. So I wrote a piece about this, uh, I believe it was a month or two ago, in which I explored the potential dynamics, uh, competitive dynamics of ASTS versus um, vertically integrated competitors with launch capabilities. And there's, there's two things that I think are important to bear in mind with ASTS that do, I think, shed some... So this fact that ASTS has half of, it, of its capex going to launch, I think it sheds some light on this. Basically, I think that as ASTS continues to specialize in its technology, in its phase array technology, and you can just see them iterating uh, on that as evidenced by, say, the, uh, the development and soon the launch of their ASIC technology, which makes their phased array antennas uh, much more powerful and the whole system much more powerful. As they do that, and then as they make the satellites bigger, I think that they're going to erode the advantage that vertically integrated launch players have. Meaning that, say, at the limit, if ASTS builds this tremendously large satellite, which is just huge, 20 times bigger than what we have now, and say they can cover the whole of Earth with just two or three of those satellites, which I think is the direction that the company is going in, then having a launch capability doesn't really make much of a difference. Just because ASTS may be at the limit, say in five, six, seven years time, only has to do two to three launches to, to cover the whole of Earth, and maybe say another two to three to cover all of space operations. So I think that over the long term, launch is not going to be that big of an advantage. I still believe that. And again, this is a little bit like this scenario with Spotify, Apple, and Amazon, when everyone was saying, well, you know, we think uh, Apple and Amazon are going to kill Spotify. And I was saying, hey, well, I think you're underestimating the difficulty of replicating Spotify's end custom experience. So here it's kind of the same. I think that it's actually called the Innovator Stack, which Jim McKelvey, a co-founder of, of Block, formerly Square, he actually termed, uh, coined this term when uh, when Square went head to head with Amazon and lost, right? So I believe that's that's what's going to prevail. But still, I wouldn't ignore the fact that half of the capex of this company is going towards launch, and that the fact that the launch chain is slowing down, or maybe you know some of these launch providers are playing hard to get. We don't really know. We have no information about this. That is increasing the average cost per satellite considerably. So up from 19 to 21 million on average per satellite to 21 to 23 million uh, per satellite. So I do believe that as you, look, as you look out over the next 12, 16, 18 months, as ASTS continues to accelerate, yes, they have a decent balance sheet, more cash than debt. Most of the debt is convertible. So interesting, but you can see that this they do have this financial pain point which I do believe once they clear, excuse me, the critical mass of satellites deployed 45 to 60, then the risk of this dependence on vertical, pro, uh, sorry, launch providers goes down. But until then, I think it's going to be very interesting to monitor this uh, in order to see really how much does ASTS depend on these launch providers? What does the competitive environment look like? It, do they play fairly? As in, do they do they treat ASTS uh, like they should fairly and impartially, etc. I'm a little bit sus suspicious of this increase in the average cost per satellite. So I'm just very, very curious to see how this evolves. But together with the gateway bookings, I believe these two things are what I'm going to be watching closely over the next year and a half. And I think that this very much fits the NVIDIA algorithm kind of blueprint, where you have a company that spends a lot of time working on a technology that no one really cares about, and then you have these sort of technological shifts in the marketplace that exponentially increase the adoption of uh, this technology, its end applications, and then over the long-term margin by, by uh, basically enhancing operating leverage. Meaning, you know, once the space economy takes off, ASTS's TAM or SAM, serviceable, addressable, 
uh, market, so the market they can actually address, uh, I think does explode. Because I think that, say, five to 10 years from now, we have a lot of robots flying around in Spain, sorry, in space, in Spain too, uh, if there's any power left, but in space and on Earth. So I think that what we have is just a lot more devices that ASTS or satellites can beam and have to beam broadband too. So I think that the opportunity is much bigger than would seem initially if you just look at this in terms of, of smartphones. Again, just to recap, still financially risky because as the company accelerates down this direction, I think that the financials are looking worse, but still extraordinary fin uh, founder, extraordinary culture, extraordinary track record of execution achievements in terms of the space industry at large. So I think very, very interesting. I'm not jumping in just yet because I'm not in a rush. I never am. I like to, before I buy something, I want to make sure that I know a company extremely well. And that just comes down to me reading and analyzing quarterly reports for a long time. And I'm not really a fan of buying and then researching. I do get why people do that because it forces you to research, but I think I have a lot more OCD than the average person. So I don't need to do that. And so for now, I just continue to enjoy uh, analyzing ASTS. And that's basically it for today, uh, today, guys. Thank you very much for joining me. As always, if you enjoyed this update, could you please share this with one friend? These deep dives and updates are for free. And so could you please share this with one friend whom you think will enjoy it? I'd be very grateful for that. Also, guys, thank you so much for your comments. Thank you so much for your likes, for sharing the videos. It means a lot to me that you guys are here. I read your feedback. I use it to make the videos better. I definitely try to. So I'm super, super grateful to have you guys here and see you next time and take care.